Right, let's talk about Godfrey Bloom and let's say good morning to Stuart Agnew, who is the UKIP MEP for the East. Stuart, good morning. Yes, hello, good morning. Good to have you on the programme. Really frustrating for Nigel Farage because let me just paint this picture. UKIP are resurgent, fantastic results at the, the county council elections. A, a massive effort from the UK Independence Party to say we're responsible, we've got policies in all different directions, take us seriously. It feels like the country is now responding and the UK Independence Party's got more respect and then Godfrey Bloom gets up on the stage and uses that word and all of a sudden we're not talking about what you stand for or the good things in the party, we're talking about one man and his loose tongue. How do you feel about that? Well, I was frustrated and disappointed as, as everybody else. And I rather felt, actually, when I heard that he'd got a fringe meeting about women in politics, that somehow trouble might be brewing, that people would go along there, our own women from, from the party, expecting to be entertained, to hear something outrageous, because that is what Godfrey is like. Um, he, he, he's actually only a few weeks younger than I am, but he, I often feel that he's talks from an era perhaps 15 years older than me in the language mm. that he uses uh, and things change and move on and I feel that he, he hasn't. The phrases he uses now would have been acceptable mm. in the 1950s or 60s but they're not now and, and that's what causes the trouble but he is very popular Yes. and, and what what, what people need to understand is to get our party going you needed somebody who was a little bit outrageous who would think outside the box so nigel farage met godfrey i think in the mid 90s and uh, godfrey was doing well in financial services and godfrey was motivated and he then turned his pockets out to get our party established in the in, in yorkshire in the north of england and made great progress and, and I remember that uh, and the sheer guts and the balls that it took to do what he did to, to get us recognised and started. And yet it's that same trait that can now come back on him uh, when now the, the political class always want conformity and, uh, and the yes. things you shouldn't say. And, and, and I can see the dilemma very, very clearly. What I'm very interested in as well is irresponsible reporting in the media because... We all know this is one man with a loose tongue. We know the context that the word was said in, and if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, he's got a fair argument to say he's using it in the old sense mm. of the word, an untidy woman rather than somebody of loose morals. Yet the media jumps on this. They were probably waiting outside wanting Godfrey to slip up because there you've got a ready-made story. Yeah, they, exactly. That, that whole thing was an accident bound to happen, in my opinion, that it was his fringe meeting, this was Godfrey's meeting... Uh, and he could be himself, and people wanted to go along and hear it because they like being entertained. They like a little bit of political in incorrectness, but there are certain elements of the media who hate us and are looking for ways to pull us down, uh, and and that is one way they can do it. But that, that is hugely irresponsible, mm. because if you're reporting politics, then you shouldn't obsess about the remarks of one man. You should, no, look at, you should look at what the rest of the party is doing. And I put to you, I think you put a, made a very good point this morning about Godfrey Bloom, historically, what he's done for the party. But it is difficult, because I know that Nigel Farage, I know that Paul Nuttall, I know that you've worked extremely hard to connect with everyday people. Um, and then Godfrey Bloom comes along and says something like this. And does it feel to you as if all your hard work has been undone? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, actually. Um because some people say, well, any publicity is good publicity. And so many people subconsciously quite like to hear a few politically incorrect phrases. They, they feel more comfortable with it. I, I am worried about this, this whole pressure on everybody to speak in a certain way and that certain phrases absolutely out of the window and you mustn't do it. It worries me, that pressure you know, that our party chairman is put under to condemn Godfrey for saying things that actually a lot of people do say in pubs. Mm. You, the, the, the Middle England, I don't know what you want to call it, but I am aware there are an awful lot of people who, who quite like to hear what Godfrey says. They quite like to see somebody yeah. kicking out against the establishment. And it, if you look at the language he uses, he never uses the F word. Now, he and I are from a generation where you just didn't use the F word, and yet it's frequently used now, uh, and, and nobody seems to mind. Yeah. And that's an example of the way things change. What I think is 
get in, in Godfrey's defence, and he's been on this programme a number of times, and the last time he came on, we had an hour-long discussion about Bongo Bongo Land, and everybody lined up to say, good on this bloke for what he said. Mm. But um, the idea that now is that he's gone too far. But I'm not defending Godfrey Bloom, but I think you, we've got to accurately report exactly what happened. In fairness to him... Um, he was making comments about women in politics. I believe he said um, that they have an essential role to play. Um, they are equal to men and they're extremely important to the UK Independence Party. I think that's what he said before this remark was made. Then somebody stood up from the floor um, and, and, and some joke was made about not cleaning behind the fridge. Uh, there was laughter in the room and he said flippantly as a throwaway remark as a punchline... Um, this room is obviously full of sluts. Well, actually, he turned to his wife and said that. Ah, OK. Yeah, he turned to his wife and said that. Uh, and uh, that was a sort of private joke between them, mm. if, you see, if you see what I mean. It was yeah, all yeah. really light-hearted. It was Godfrey's show, Godfrey's meeting. That was Godfrey doing what Godfrey does, and everyone was enjoying it. But somebody comes in and it might say spoils the party. Mm. But... but we have to expect this in UK. Not everybody will like us. I'm actually very heartened by the way you're speaking. I was expecting you to be really confrontational and, and in my face and saying how terrible it all was. And actually, absolutely I'm not. Delighted to hear what you've been <laughs> saying. Well, absolutely not. And I tell you where I'm coming from. I, I, I find sometimes I actually find presenting these programmes really frustrating because I could come on the radio this morning and I could say, "Oh, isn't it an awful word?" and and Godfrey Bloom isn't he a terrible character? And we get a full switchboard of people with a with varying degrees of opinions about Godfrey Bloom. But if we say, I, I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill. If we say to politicians, politicians we're going to put you in a box and you can only say certain things um, and you mustn't have an opinion here and you mustn't have an opinion there and and you are very confined we're going to have very confined very boring politicians and very boring politics and this is exactly what you see with the other three political parties at this this sameness approach i'm so pleased to hear you talking the way you are i really am i'm delighted uh, and the the the, the the problem we face now is that we're under pressure to squeeze out people like Godfrey, to squeeze out these free spirits, these free thinkers, these people who've got the guts and the balls to really try and make a change. We, we will feel obliged to push them out mm. and go for the conformity, the play safe. And, and yet we've always said we are a party that's opposed to political correctness, but we find now that we're forced into it. It's very difficult. Yes, it is. And also it's, it's very, very hard when you're... It's very hard when you're broadcasting or very hard when you're in your position um, and you're trying to make a comment and you want to make a comment, but you've got to think about the, the things you can't say, what you can say, the yeah. best way of getting it across, and you don't want somebody from a paper who is waiting to take offence to jump on what you've got to say and, and to spin it. And I think it leads to this very messy, dirty politics where people doesn't people don't really say what they actually believe they and don't. what they think. They don't. They talk they're so, in a, in a, they're so in a... scared of the media, and, and quite rightly so, because the media at times are pretty out of control. Yes, I mean, yeah, and they have their own agendas. But it, mm -hmm. You see, the whole thing then went on to something else. Uh, there was somebody from Channel 4, was it Michael Crick? Michael Crick, yeah. He, he confronted Godfrey with our conference magazine. Our, yeah. And he said, there's all these faces on here, why aren't any of them black or brown? Yeah. Well, the answer to that was those were the faces of our elected councillors in 2013, just recently. And as it happened, none of them were black or brown. But they weren't random faces. They were the faces of our victorious candidates. And, and Michael Crick didn't appreciate that. Well, also, Nigel Farage did a speech not so long ago where he said um, that he was trying to uh, broaden out the, the, the parameters of the UK Independence Party and he wanted to take in more people from ethnic backgrounds. This is, this is the thing about being responsible. That is, um, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not breaking my impartiality this morning. It feels to me, and I'm not saying anything about Michael Crick, who used to, of course, work for the BBC, now works for Channel 4, but it appears that people will go to the UK Independence Party, to the Green Party, to the Lib Dems, Conservatives and Labour with an agenda, whereas a, with a, as a reporter, go with an open mind and then report on what you're seeing. Tell well, the story. I, I, I'm quite happy to say on the record and publicly that I think Michael Crick does have an agenda. We have researched his past and he's very much on the far left of the political spectrum. Uh, and he can use his position to further his own political aims and ambitions. But we have to face that in the party. We can't expect the media to be nice to us the whole time. We're going to have enemies. And 
the political establishment are struggling to cope with us. They don't quite know what to do about us. For years and years, it was Labour and Conservative and the sort of half party, the protest vote to the Lib Dems. Never has a fourth party come along in British politics and actually got somewhere. Mm. And we keep being told, and I keep being told, oh, well, you've got this far, Aggers, but you won't go any further. You won't go any further. We wait till the next general election. It'll all go back to normal. And yet we do keep making progress. And there's a lot of head scratching going on. Uh uh, what's very interesting is the battle that sometimes I have to try and get the UK Independence Party on the air and the battle I also have to get the Green Party on the air and I think we should spend more time listening to the fringe parties to give everybody a bit of a platform because that, after all, is democracy. Um, Stuart, let me just get John uh, involved in the conversation. John's in docking. John, what would you like to say? You've got the ear of Stuart Agnew, who is the UKIP MEP for the East. Well, all I would like to say is um, whatever context and whatever cover you put on it, and whatever you say about the fact that one of your associates called women sluts and he is in a political position, to me, quite frankly, that puts him in the box that, quite frankly, the label sticks and it should stick. And um, by all means, have your minority politics and that's where you will stay because, quite frankly, decent living people know where you're at and that's it. Right, well, there's one person who didn't like it and who won't vote for us. Well, I, I, it's not that. It's that, you know, we've come a long way. Um, to call women sluts is just not on in whatever context. And it's, it's not unusual, is it? The, the, you know, you're, uh, you haven't got any seats. Whether you, you might get a couple, I don't know. But, you know, thank goodness you will remain a minority um, party. But having said that, at the same time, it's nice that we ha are not complaining. You know, if you wish to stand up for the policies that you do, that's fine by me. But at the same time, there are certain, in my opinion, there are certain degrees. And, you know, to call women sluts in whatever context is, quite frankly, um, it's, it's part of the rabble that you seem to attract, which is very sad. Right. I want to have a bet with you, a wager. I enjoy having wages because I will put my money where my mouth is. You said we will remain a minority party. You will. There's no and question I'm going to bet, that. John. I'm going to bet, John. Five hundred pounds. You prepared to go that far? Don't be absurd. I, uh, you know, you might have the money, and uh, and to you it might be a bravado thing. I've got five hundred pounds. I'm talking about decency. Don't bring money into it. Well, I'm say what you've got to say without your bet. I think you're wrong in that we'll, we will remain a minority party, irrespective of, of, the, of the gaffes that Godfrey makes. I think that most people in this country want to be run by their own British government and not by unelected officials and bureaucrats in Brussels. And, and that is the feeling. Now, we are messengers to get this message out, and some of our me messengers say other things at the same time, and then they get scolded for it. Godfrey will be dealt with, ultimately, at the ballot box. Uh, John, thanks for your call. Nick's in Snedersham. Nick, uh, what would you like to say? Stuart Agnew's listening. Good morning, sir. Well, I was quite prepared to stomach a lot of the rubbish that you were talking until you said that Michael Crick was on the far left of the political spectrum. When you say something like that, I just wonder which position you could be really in on the political spectrum. What is your definition of right-wing politics and things like this? Michael Crick has always been a pro-right-wing, a pro neoliberal channel, typical channel for uh, presenter. So and when you say that you give are under attack all the time from the liberal press, it's not under attack from the liberal press at all. If you were really under attack from the liberals or anything left of centre, people like Nigel Farage and yourself and UKIP wouldn't have got any kind of uh, exposure at all whatsoever, yet alone doing well in the polls. Well, we research Michael Crick at uh, um, one of our party officials researched him, and he is, has a far-left background. That much I can tell you about him. So Absolutely. we're not surprised that he well, uses every opportunity he can to have a go at us. But he's well, got a right to do it. some other material. But on the, con on the problem, on the position of Godfrey Freeman, it's nothing to do with him being out of, out of touch or of an old era. All these things, all these comments, and they're becoming too coincidental too frequent now to be killed. It's all a political stunt by you, lot, simply because it's to, to detract away from the fact that all you are, really, is a glorified Tory pressure rump. What is the difference, really, on fundamental economic agenda? What is the difference between UKIP and the Tories? 
Um, the difference is quite considerable. First of all, we want our own elected representatives to run this country and not have 75% of our laws made by unelected officials in Brussels. And what laws, one made, crucial and difference. What laws may these be? I beg your pardon? And what laws may these be? What, what laws are Europe making that is any really different from what we have here? Well, what we have to obey their laws. So in the field of agriculture, fishing, defence procurement, employment law, energy policy, employment uh, again, local, local, local government procurement, long-term transport strategy, that is all dealt with in Brussels. And I vote, I should think, on an average 300 times a month Put, putting these things through, I vote against. But this is where the power lies now. This is where it is, and we object to that. And it's our right to object. We form a political party. We put ourselves in front of the electorate and say, here we are, you can vote for us or tell us to go to hell. But slowly and surely, more and more people are voting for us. And while that happens, we are confident. Uh, Nick, thank you. Final call, I'll put you, Stuart. Thank you, by the way, for your time. I do appreciate this. This is um, I, I, we've hijacked you with calls. Forgive us. Um, this is David, uh, who's in Thorpe St Andrew. David, what would you like to say to Stuart Agnew? Uh, good morning, Stuart. Hello. Um, you probably don't know me, but you certainly knew my father-in-law, who was your gamekeeper, Mr. Farrow. Mr. Farrow. Farrow. Far oh, Gilbert. That's it. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. I, I think mean, he was the oldest gamekeeper in Norfolk. Yes, he was, and I mean, he was. Uh, I was born only three hundred yards from his house, and used to go. He was a small holder in those That's days. Right, yes, yes. And he was very proud of his uh, uh, the the calves he reared. Um, oh yes, yes. I have very <laughs> fond memories of Gilbert. Very fond memories of him. Well, what I was going to say is that I admire you for publishing everything that you stand for. In the local press, you let us know exactly what is going on in Europe every month, and I read your column every time you put it in. And I have to agree with, with what you're saying. Well, th th thank you very much. I, I started that, and I do it in five other papers in five other counties, because I noticed that nobody actually does. They, lots of political commentary on what's going on in, uh, in Westminster, etc., but these laws that keep going through on and on and on, nobody seems to to want to know. Well, we, we know exactly what's going on because you keep us informed. Yes, and well, that's what a politician I, should do. I buy the space. Um, we get about 130 words, and I try and put in three different topics. And I always like to say at the end, in the EDP anyway, I have a room of how often I voted in the month, to try and make people realise that the numbers of rules and amendments that keep coming through and uh, thank you so much for following it and I get good feedback from other people as well and I, I will continue with, with, with it uh, David, thanks for your call I think it's probably worth this programme coming from uh, Brussels at some point uh, to talk about what MEPs do um, and how often they have to vote and what it's like to be an MEP so we'll talk to you off air about that Stuart and it'd be good to see you over there at some point because I think that'd be a worthwhile exercise um, and a good uh, investment of BBC money um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart, really good to have you on the show.